greetings. In the name of our Lord Jesus, it's such a privilege to be here tonight to minister again in his dear, precious name. And now, Heavenly Father, we thank Thee already because Thou hears our, our desires when we make them known in our heart. You know even the thoughts of our heart. Our brother is very sick. I may have never met him in my life, but Thou knowest him. I'm sending that handkerchief in the name of the Lord Jesus. I pray, God, when it's laid upon his body, that the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and God shall raise him up. Grant it, Lord, spare him this night. I pray in Christ's name, amen. There has been a few things that's been bothering me, and that for some time. And I, I don't know any better place in my life to start from than Connorsville, Indiana, to do what I'm fixing to do. See, that's right. It's a little, probably my last revival before going overseas. And they're making ready now. I don't know just what the time. I'm a little startled. Brother Beeler here. Uh, I didn't. I noted man had a great name, and I slipped in behind a coke machine to pray for him. You heard me confessing to the night when he was sitting here. And then I went back home. They called me again. And said, "Come on in." So I went over there and just knelt. And while I was kneeling there, our Lord Jesus stopped the hemorrhage he's never had it since. He was perfectly normal and well from an. So. He just follows the meetings, and a very fine brother. And while we were sitting talking with Brother Beeler here, been taking recordings here, an evangelist, a World War veteran, had a disaster and hurt one of his hands and had to amputate it. And God, if you hear his story, if you're an evangelistic, wanting an evangelist, I would recommend Evangelist Beeler as one of my bosom friends and a co-worker with me in the tabernacle at Jeffersonville. And He's here. He never told me to say that, but I just said it because I felt led to say it. And a very loving brother. And while we were sitting, having a meal together, I started to say something to Dr. Cobbles, and I began to talk to Brother Bosworth, which is standing right before me. And he's in Africa, been there nearly a year, setting the meetings together. And then as I seen Brother Bosworth, he was coming this way to me, and I was talking to him, Brother Bosworth, and Brother Cobbles and Brother Beeler looked around. And why was I talking to Brother Bosworth while talking to them? And here he was coming across the, the waters like that. I don't know what it means. The only thing I can say is that's what it was. There's something has happened somewhere recently. I was riding one evening going down the road about five or six months ago. The house had been packed all day. And, and I said to the wife, if you can wait just a little bit, let me, don't let anyone else come in till I can get just a little rest. I'm just about to pull my, my hair. And I got out and... Went down the road, was riding along in the car, and all at once I seen something, the windshield began to, I looked, and it, something happened. And, uh, and I seen Brother Bosworth coming, walking to me, and he laid down, and some doctors picked him up and put him on a bed, and he was crying, and he was calling my name. And I, I heard my wife saying, what's the matter? said, you sat so quiet for five minutes and going around real steep cliffs on an old a rural road like that. And I didn't even know I was driving. So I stopped and I said, honey, something's happened to Brother Bosworth. And let's pray. The Lord wants me to pray right now. And we started praying. And in just 24 hours, we checked the time. I was sitting in the house with a number of friends. And the phone rang. And it was a cablegram from Durban, South Africa, that when he stepped off the train, the apostate glands closed up, and he was carried to a hospital, and he was calling for me to pray for him. And just exactly, the angel of the Lord had beat that cablegram here 24 hours. That's, that's how, how it ended the praying. And then uh, immediately after that, we gave him a call, and he was done up and going again. Then the Lord had done, heard, and answered prayer. Now, isn't that wonderful? And God in heaven knows that to be true. And how that he's, he's been wonderful. When the angel of the Lord, I've had a lot of criticism. I... I hope you believe me to be an honest person. I, I try to be honest. I, I tr want to be a man of honor. And a man of honor will be truthful and honest. And I, I've tried hard to serve the Lord. And I, when I, what I'm going to say now is just for just a few moments, if you want to catch it now, I want to go in the magazines. And now to this audience here tonight, and a, a confession. In the beginning of my ministry... When a little baby born up in the hills of Kentucky, 
this light that you see on this picture here that we have tonight and have been selling uh, at the meeting, just that what it, we have to send and get them ourselves. It's a copyright. That same light come in that little cabin that stood over the bed, a little corn shuck bed where I was born, in a cabin in Kentucky on April 6, 1909. And from a little bitty, little small lad of about, I suppose, two years old, was the first time I remember that speaking to me. And he told me I'd live near a city called New Albany, Indiana. Well, that's where I've lived. And I was, that was 180 or 90 miles up in Kentucky, near Burtsville, Kentucky. Now, that's uh, all down through life that kept being remarkable. He'd show me things, tell me things that's coming to pass. And I'm, to this night, I would like to ask any person in this world, and I'm willing to be exposed by any remark, that if any one time that you ever heard say one thing but what was absolutely the truth, and if everything come to pass that he said so far, as far as I know, but this vision about Africa and India, and it will be. He tells things that will be, and things that has been, things that's on the coming. I can't do it myself. He doesn't. And I've tried to be honest. And when the angel of the Lord met me, I first, the people told me, the ministers, my pastor, and the head man of the church, the officials, and so forth, told me it was the devil. Only the devil would do things like that. Well, of course, it scared me. For years and years, I shunned it. But one night up here in Indiana, I was praying at an old fishing camp where I used to go fish, and I'd go back in there many times to pray. And he had come to me. Under this light stood a man, around six foot tall, 100 and 200 pounds, big arms, dark hair to his shoulders, and he's standing under that light. And he told me I was born in this world to pray for sick people. Now, that's what he told me. And he said, and you're to go be pray for people around the world, for kings and monarchs. And so, How could I believe that with a grammar school education? And I said to him, I said, sir, I dwell among my people which is poor. I'm uneducated. Therefore, I could not do this. He said, I said, they wouldn't believe me. He said, as the prophet Moses was given two signs, so shall it be given to you of two signs of a vindication of your ministry. And, uh, and I said, me pray for kings. He said, that was what I was to do. All right. And uh, so then he sa I asked him, and he told me what, to, what it would be, how to, to pray for the people, and said, for divine healing. And then said, you'll know the very secrets of their heart. And I said, that's what I was here praying about. They told me, my ministers and them told me it was of the devil. And he told me it was of God and referred to these scriptures that I referred to of Jesus Christ. I know the thoughts of the people of the woman at the well and so forth. Well, I told him I'd go. And that's been six years ago. He yeah, nearly seven. And that time I visited three kings' palaces, which has called on me to pray for them. And doctors and great men of congressmen and everything has been healed throughout the entire world. Statesmen and everything. I'll tell you what I've done, my Christian friend, as a confession. I say this without, without bitterness, I say this with the sincerity of my heart before God, who is my solemn judge. I believe I've done wrong in one way. I believe I've depended too much upon that discerning spirit instead of praying for the people. Now, he never told me to go and tell everybody, just talk to them. He said, pray for the sick. But I was, and here's what he said, if you'll be sincere when you pray and get the people to believe, nothing will stand before the prayer. Many of you have read that story, have you? How many has read my life story on that? I guess everybody in here. See? It's published in 17 different languages around the world. So, it's, uh, and tonight, by God's grace, it's seven years ago, just a little local Baptist preacher here in Jeffersonville. Tonight, by God's grace and help, I have contacted, direct or indirect, around 10 million people. And it's sent out many great campaigns across the world. Right in my own meetings, there's been nearly half a million converts. And I don't know what it's produced out in others. And now, by that, I'm very thankful. But here's what I think I've done. I think in bringing the people up, if I could show you in my office just for the last year that I've kept, just of letters who says, Brother Branham, I, I love you as a Christian brother, but I've been to as many as 14 and 15 of your meetings, and I can never be able to get up there for you to pray for me. Well... Then I get others that 
Here the other day, a man down in Arkansas gave me a real good, a good friendly criticism. I appreciate that. Sometimes that helps me. It'll help anyone, a good criticism. He said, Brother Branham, I've been to all the meetings, the divine healing meetings throughout the country. He said, I think yours tops. He said, I appreciate you in every way, but said, I think God raised up old Roberts to take your place because you're, there's something wrong with you that you won't pray for the people. That cut. That hurt. God bless Brother Oral Roberts. He's my brother. If God cho chooses him to go out and... He said, while you're praying for three people, Oral Roberts will pray for 500. Uh, he does. He just brings them through. To, you've been to Oral's meeting. How many ever been to Oral's meeting? Uh, uh, most of you. Oral is one of my converts, to not to divine healing, because he believed in the first place. But he comes sit on my sidelines of Kansas City, having a little bitty tent meeting, a dozen or two over the other side of the city. He come over there and he said, Brother Branham, at that night back behind the curtains where we got our picture standing there, you see it in the voice of healing. He said, Brother Branham, you thank God to hear my prayer for, for he was sick. I said, he'll hear anybody's prayer that'll be sincere. He said, here I go to pray for the sick. I said, the Lord God bless you, my brother. The little Tommy Osborne, I think is the most settled man there is on the field anywhere. If anybody knows Tommy Osborne, I think there's not a man on the, on the field or anywhere in your divine healing campaigns to, that's any more settled. He don't make any kind of a big shows or brags. He preaches the gospel, never lays his hands on a person, but he, he does most of his works over in foreign countries. And he goes over there and just explains divine healing so plain that the people just raise up and accept Christ and get healed and walk away. He doesn't make any wild claims. He only claims that he knows. When he comes to me, we're sitting out on the porch. He'd seen that maniac out there. You read it in the book here. Little Tommy, when he was converted, just a little old brother up there had about a dozen in his mission. He sat there that night and seen that maniac walk run to the platform. And brother, you mustn't bluff when you come against anything like that. You must know what you're talking about. An insanity. And so he's seen what happened. He locked himself in a room for three days, nailed himself up, and then come down to my place. And he said, Brother Branham, uh, my heart's stirred. You think God has given me a gift of divine healing? I looked at him. He was a promising young man. And I said, uh, very nervous. He just, you know how he is, a little bitty fellow. And he, I said, Brother Osborne, look, you don't understand what a gift of healing is, brother. A gift of healing is faith in healing. I said, what you believe. If you believe it, of course. That's right. It's all by faith. But I said, Brother Osborne, you're a promising little man. And I see that you're, you, I believe you're a good level scripture teacher. I said, let me ask you something. If you want to be a success in life, don't claim nothing you haven't got. It'll be showed anyhow after a while that you're, or you're falsely. See? I said, just be honest before God. And go on out. I said, you know, you believe the Bible teaches divine healing? He said, yes, Brother Bram. I said, teach that. God made you a preacher. And you go out and just preach the word. I said, you see the old oak tree, which that was Brother Bosworth. I said, get with him, stay with him about a year. Let him teach you all the angles around. I said, he's been preaching divine healing before I was born. He was preaching divine healing and holding meeting. And Brother Osborne stayed with him about a year and a half. And he's one of the most solid men on the field. Now, here's what it's done, Christian friend. How many Holy Ghost people sure are not born again? Let's see your hands. Way up high now. Pentecostal people. All right. It's you I'm going to talk to. And I'm going to talk to you from the depths of my heart, which this is going in magazines now, and many magazines that will go across the world. See, while I'm going to say. It's a, it's a pity that Christianity and Christian people can't settle down to real truth about things. It, it is. See? Now, i tell you what. I have tried to follow the leadings of the Holy Spirit. When I first started praying for the sick, I started out, and the people, they all seek after wonders and signs. The tr I say as Martin Luther in his, uh, in his uh, no footnotes in one of his sermons, he said, the people goes after gifts instead of the giver. That's true. See, they go after signs instead of the giver. Now, that's a whole lot among we people. I'm glad that if you'll let me call myself one of you tonight. Among one of your group. That's what's the trouble. Not only in our Pentecostal groups, but out yonder in the fundamental ranks too. It's a carnal comparison, friends. I say this with love. But it's got to a place that people see the, something done, then everybody tries to impersonate that same thing. And when they do that, it's not the truth, brother. They bring things which is unscriptural. Here the other day, a man come in 
uh, a man could drove all the way from California to my place with a, a little girl about 16 years old. And some fellow said, I've got the spirit like that too. He said, I've got a spirit discernment. He said, oh, that girl's got cancer. And I scared a little thing to death. They drove from California. That child didn't have more cancer than us, than, than uh, this uh, little boy here is cross-eyed. <laughs> See? Not a bit more. The child was all right. Hundreds of people coming into the meeting. And here someone wrote to my secretary the other day, Mrs. Cox, and said, you, I have the spirit of the discernment too. He said, of course, I know. Uh, Brother Branham said, you have gallstone, you have this, and you, well, the list of things that long. He said, the reason you're living up in a house that a stream of water runs under. Friends, no wonder this world scorns and laughs at divine healing. Here the other day, I seen that person had a, an old man in a sheet. I went to what they call a healing service. They're jerking him up and down like that. The old fellow had heart trouble. And a woman taking a stick and running around beating like that, saying, get out, devil, shoo, shoo, like that. Talking about divine healing. I went to a healing, a man very prominently known. Said, I got a healing in my right hand. Laid it on a person, said, feel that, feel that. And I called the man back behind his tent, and I said, it's a lie. That's right. I said, you can get by that, sure, people. Just believe, you just hear anything you tell them. And I said, in the sight of God, you'll have to answer for that someday. And here the other night, standing right here, the man's listening to me, no doubt now. A fine man. Uh, I don't know his name. I was talking to him yesterday. The man's probably listening to me right now. He stood there and was talking to me about people coming around. He said, here's what makes it on divine healing. He said, I've watched about your offerings, Brother Branham. See? He said, I know you've never strained on offerings. I said, no, sir. No, indeedy. And he said, uh, and many times my managers have said, Brother Branham, we ain't got enough money to make the expenses. We got to put some pressure on the meeting. I said, no, you'll never put pressure on any meeting and I'm preaching in for money. No, sir. I never come for that. I come to help people. That's exactly right. Sometimes it gets so low we have to go and maybe borrow money somewhere to tithe it over. And sometimes our meetings, maybe in the thousands, won't average over uh, a half a cent apiece of the people. But we never let them beg for money. No, sir. That's against the rules. And th this man was telling me, he said, I was in a campaign here not long ago. And he said, do you know what happened? He said, uh, uh, the man stood up and he said, after he took an offering, he'd go down and say, who'll give me tens and who'll give me fives and like that. Uh, brother, God have mercy on me. If I have ever have to get to do that, then I'll go back home and lay on my stomach and drink Branch water and eat soda crackers and half starved to death and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ before I do something like that. God being my helper. That's right. That's right. Yes, sir. God is able. He said, he told a couple of farmers, said, now the Lord is going to send a storm through here and tear up your farms if you don't put in a couple of hundred dollars. In the... Now, that's a lie. And that's just what gets people so down on divine healing and truth. But, brother, in the midst of all that, you fundamental people sitting here, there's a real genuine God that heals the sick. And there's a real genuine. That's right. I went to a ladies' meeting here some time ago. I won't call names, but just to show you. The lady stood up and said, I, uh, uh, the Lord tells me that somebody in here got a uh, kidney trouble. Oh, sure. There's probably a dozen or two sitting in here that's got kidney trouble. The Lord says there's somebody in here that's uh, backslid. And um, he's talking to him right now. Well, I, probably that's right. The gospel being preached is talking to every backslider. See, that's true. That's psychology, friends. That's purely psychology. That's all. And now I'm, I'm honest with you, and I'm going to tell you something. See? I went to a meeting here recently, and a man very well known and a Baptist brother was sitting with me, and he just got what. And you wonder why I'm not in the voice of healing. That's the reason. Everything going along like that. Why, brother, a certain person in there that said they were sitting before in their room praying and said, God the Father sent two angels down and picked him up and took him up in the presence of God and said, My son, I'm giving you the gift of divine healing. Now, that's wrong. There is no such a thing. They said, My a gift, but not the gift. See? And take before God the Father. No man has seen God look at him in his face like that. That's right. And said it, the angels, and said, he said, my son, I'm giving you the gift of divine healing. And I'm sending you back to the earth and giving you power to open the eyes of the blind, to unstop the ears of the deaf, and so forth like that. And people reading that shouting, brother, <laughs> this is kind of cutting it home tonight. But listen, this is what it will do you. You might not like me now, but brother, at the day of judgment, you'll see I've told you the truth and been one man's honest with you. That's right. Now, that's just as unscriptural as it can be. 
And when this Baptist brother come around, he said, Brother Branham, I got your paper. I said, not my paper. He laid it down and said, look at this. What do you think of this? I have nothing against the voice of healing. But the trouble of the voice of healing, here's what I got away from it. It glorifies the man instead of the Christ. Christ is what we want to get glory. This man's got a tent that outseats this one and this one outseats that one. What? Who is this man? Who are we? Amen. We're nothing but six foot of dust. By the mercies of God, we got what we deserve. We'd be in hell. That's exactly right. It's Jesus Christ we're trying to exalt and point to. Now, where you got a half a dozen or ten thousand, what difference does that make? You're looking for numbers where the Catholic Church has done got us snowed under and the world's done got us beat all together. <laughs> It's not numbers. God doesn't dwell in multitudes. He dwells in sincere hearts. Christ, what do you think Christ's crowd would have compared with Caiaphas' would have called over the nation? His little crowd of three or four or five thousand at a time when they gather together and the people with Christ say, but Caiaphas is going to call three or four million together. So there you are. Don't not in crowd, friends. There's, don't get that on your mind. But this, this person said, this a doctor of divinity said, Brother Branham, did God do that? I said, I'm going to beat you to it. I can't say whether he did or didn't. I'm not the judge. But I'm going to say before you tell me, let me see and prove it. See? That's right. Let me see it proved, then I'll believe it. See? If God gives a man power to open blind eyes, it doesn't belong to God anymore. It belongs to the man. If, if you give me the money to buy a suit of clothes, that your Brother Bram, here's money to buy you a suit, it's not yours anymore. It's mine. If I'm a healer, then I can heal. If God give me the power to open blinded eyes, then I can open them. That's my business, and it belongs to me. But God never give it to any man. He hasn't give it to me, and I don't believe there's any man living today that has it. And it ain't coming because that lazy Calvary, it's already been done. It's the only thing any man can do is point you to what's already been done for you in Jesus Christ. That's right. He's the Jehovah Jireh. He's God's provided sacrifice, and everything that you have need of lays in Him. Standing there the night. A lady come up. This man said, I smell a spirit of an infirmity. Now, the sense of smelling declaring a supernatural being. You know that's not right. And yet, five or six thousand people sitting there. I, I smell an infirmity. It's here somewhere. I, you know, I'm not criticizing the man. I'm just only, I ask you first if you were Pentecostal people. I'm trying to get something to you the truth. And, brother, I'm going to make a confession. I think I'm the cause of a big part of it. That's right. I ask God to forgive me. If I'd have kept my senses right and not listened to a bunch of managers to try to just bring everybody by and this, that, or the other, and went ahead and done what God told me to, I'd been better off tonight and so would the whole church. Right. True. That's the honest truth. Sure, that's a sign. Absolutely. I'll give anyone, you go down to my city, you take any of my books, you go anywhere you want to and see if one thing was ever predicted, anything. And if I was dying right here at this platform tonight, my hands laying on the Bible, right here before my Lord Jesus, He is the supernatural life that you see. I have seen Him. I've seen Him right out there standing with my eyes wide open looking at Him. He's come to me and told me things and that gift of discernment to know things that was to come to pass and how He reveals it, it's without one blemish the honest to goodness truth. Now that's right. That's, and that wasn't done to... Moses, when he taken his signs, he didn't go down and say, look here, I'm healing my hand with leprosy, you see? And I'm taking this... He did it once. Then said, come on, follow me. But that's been wrong. Everybody's rallied to see the gift work. Everybody's rallied to see this work. And every person that they think that God don't tell them just what's in their life and how it's going to outcome, they can't step out for faith. It's, it'll become such a thing like the brass serpent was one of these days. The prophet run in and tore the thing up. That's the truth. Now, I'm preaching to myself. And what's that, that, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. And I did wrong in doing that. When thousands of people have come to the meeting, I ought to be able to bring them across the platform praying for them. What God told me to do. Don't you think that's the truth? So, by God's grace and God's help, and if He'll give me grace to do it, I'm intending by His help, sure, them signs, that gift, it'll always accompany my life. It'll always be, as long as I'm here on earth, that'll be just the same. Gifts and callings are without repentance. God will deal with me the way I use it, but it's without repentance. It'll always remain there. That's true. And... Uh, if I'd have went ahead like I started first, I just brought the people across the line, and I prayed for each one of them, 
And when God something showed me that there was something wrong or something I should tell a person, I stopped them and told them what to do. And then I went ahead and prayed for another. I prayed for 100, maybe 150, 200 a night, maybe more than that. And people just flocked in everywhere. But now what's happened? There's just a few. I have to stop. And, it's, and if I just let the vision come as it will, it doesn't bother me. It won't go in here. It's a divine gift that I take up my own parable of words that he told me and, and go forward to meet the thing. Then you see you're forcing yourself into something. See what I mean? But now, there's, there's people. There's even people sitting right here since I've been talking. I absolutely know. But sitting right here and seeing the angel Lord stand over in vision, know what's wrong with them. I'm standing right here on the platform where I'm standing now. Now, that's the truth. See? But I, I just don't say nothing about it. And I just go ahead and pray for the sick. And I think that's what I'm going to do by God's help. That's right. Go right around and start praying for the sick. And God says anything to do, well, then I'll do it. See? And if he don't tell me, then I'll just go right ahead and pray for the sick and go on. It's up to you to believe it. And now look, through there, everybody's seen the meetings. When it first started, there's a lot of tinsel on it. When it first started, while there was tens of thousands of people would swarm out everywhere, then everybody began to get three or four of these Pentecostal groups. One of them said, come go with us. We're the, we're the larger group. The other one said, no, you, you, we, we got the most spiritual people. I stood in the breach and said, we are brethren. Not, not what this group was, what that group was. We are one in Christ Jesus and, and quit the fussing about who's this and who's that. See? You're getting just as formal as the rest of the churches by it, you see. And, of course, it will and finally be laid on the shelf just like the rest of them. But children of God, you are in the church. Don't let your little churches fall like that. Stay here and stay spiritual. And look at the next man across the street and recognize him as your brother. Yes, sir. That's right. No matter what church he belongs to, if he's a Methodist and got the Holy Ghost, shake his hand and say, Hello, brother. Baptist, Presbyterian, or Roman Catholic. No matter what he is, he belongs to the Church of God, Assemblies of God, Pentecostal, United Church, or whatever they are. Everybody's brothers in Christ Jesus when we become born again of the Spirit of God. That's right. And there's no difference in it. God set some in the church for certain things, but there's no difference in the whole overall picture. Amen. All right. You believe that? Say amen. amen. Will you pray for me and, and the success that God will help me? And by my friends, if I got anything that I think is wrong, I'm going to confess it right here. Not wait to get up yonder. I'm going to tell it right here. That's right. And I've been honest with you. And I'm trying to be honest. I, I want to be honest. And I, if I'm honest with you, I'll be honest with God. And if I'm not honest with you, I can't be honest with God. That's right. Because you're the purchase of His blood. The way I treat you, that's my attitude towards God. I've often wondered what I'd do if I had a little charger that had two drops of the literal blood of Jesus that fell at Calvary. How I would embrace that and how close I'd walk with it that I didn't uh, drop it or anything. Do you know in the sight of God I've got a greater than that here before me tonight? I've got the purchase of His blood. He loved you more than He loved His own life. He gave His life for you. So how must I handle you? I must be honest and sincere. And I think maybe if we'll just start a new man and women here, just preach the gospel. Don't claim nothing that you can't back up for Satan's going to bring you to a showdown. Yeah. Exactly right. That's right. Like people trying to impersonate the Holy Spirit. Many of them went out and spoke with tongues and claimed to have the Holy Ghost and done everything there was to be done. That's right. They didn't have the Holy Spirit to start with. Right. But they're just trying to impersonate. Some Act like somebody else. You be just what you are, and God help us to see the day when everybody will be what they are. Just exactly that. Anything I despise is a hypocrite. That's right. And God hates the same thing. It'd be better for an infidel to have a better chance getting to heaven than a hypocrite. Now you know that's the truth. An infidel, sincere and hard, couldn't see it. I believe that's the truth. Now let's be sincere and let's be just what we are. If I wasn't for Christ tonight, I'd be against Christ. I be against him, and I'm, I'm for him, I believe him, I love him, I'm ready to die for him right now, because I believe him, and I believe divine healing, and I know it's right, and that's why I'm here to clear it. If I didn't believe it, I certainly wouldn't be here trying to say something that I didn't believe in. I'd be here declaring just what I thought was right. If I could join up with the fundamental groups and say that the Church of Christ and uh, many of the others that doesn't believe in divine healing, and in a way, if I could believe that was the truth, I'd be right with them tonight. Exactly. But I do not believe that they're scripturally right, so I believe that God's word here proves divine healing. I believe the Holy Spirit, the proof of the pudding is the eating thereof. Look what God's doing. See, and I know it's the truth, and that's the reason I'm with this group tonight, is because that I believe they've got the real, absolutely charm of God's love in their hearts. I believe it. 
I believe they need a lot of good sound teaching, but I believe they got the Holy Ghost. I believe that. That's the reason I'm with them. That's the reason they sponsor meetings, because they believe in the supernatural. And that's the group, some great fellow, well, i tell you who it was. It was Dr. Sandman, the Billy Grimm's uh, teacher of science. He was sitting in my house a few weeks ago, signed his book. He said, Brother Bram, that's the most marvelous thing. He said, there, God revealed his life to him, told him what he done back when he was a child and things. He said, that's the most marvelous thing i ever seen. He said, my. So said, the only thing it is, Brother Bram, you fool around too many. He said, they tell me you're, just about half of your groups are more Pentecostal. I said, what if I come to Wheaton? Will you sponsor it? He said, well, of course. I said, that's what I thought. Uh-huh. Of course. It's the Pentecostal people who believe it. And where the carcass is, the eagles will be gathered. Exactly. That's right. God help us send us teachers that will straighten, that get these old middle walls of petition broke down so we can get to be one in Christ Jesus so the rapture can take us home. Get it over with. Amen. I feel like preaching a few minutes right now. Amen. Let's read some over in Joel now, and then we're going right straight to the prayer line. And there's a, a few comments. Over in the book of Joel, I was sitting out here on the side of the road a while ago. Uh, Billy and I come up, and he come in to bring the books in and things. And say, by the way, if you know anybody that wants books, remember, tomorrow night's the last night. I respect God's day. I don't sell on Sunday. There's no literature or nothing that's sold in our meetings or nothing on Sunday. No, sir, she closes up Saturday night. If you won't get a book now, I didn't think about Sunday night, I'll get it yeah, tomorrow night. I thank you. I'm not a book salesman. I don't, I don't sell books, friends. If I didn't think that would help you, I wouldn't say one word about it and wouldn't even have it published or permitted to be published. And they're not my books. I buy them at 40% off and bring them here and sell them to you. That's exactly for handling charges. That book belongs to Gordon Lindsay. The other one belongs to uh, Julius Statscliffe. And I just send and get them to the groups like that, and then, I, and then give them, uh, and I get them 40% off and send them out like that and give them out to the people. That's the truth. In the picture, I just have it printed, and that's just handling charges. Exactly. And that's, get a permit to have so much printed, and then send them out like that. Not one thing. Friends, it's the truth. The night I've had is as much as a million five hundred thousand dollars given me at one time. And if I had to rake up tonight anything over, a, if I had to rake up over five hundred dollars tonight of my own personal money, I'd have to be shot. If, if, if that's what it's taken. That's somebody who like Calgary can to give me enough money, twenty-eight thousand dollars to build a house. And here's my people right here in the church in Knowles. And here's the trustees, some of them sitting right here, it's acting on the board right now. And when they built that house, I looked at it, a nice little six-room house up there, and I thought that's beautiful. And I said, I don't deserve that, Lord. And I turned it over to the tabernacle. And it belongs to them, not me. I've brought nothing into this world. I'll take nothing out but my soul before God. And I want it to be clean and pure when I hit him that day. And I have taken no money for no people. That's exactly I could have been a millionaire tonight if I took the money. It's not what I begged, but what people offered me to give me. And I wouldn't do it. No, sir. And I feel the same way tonight. Before God, I tell the truth. God knows it. I have covered no person's money or anything they've got. The only thing I want is your favor so I can tell you about Jesus Christ and His glory. That's true. All right. Joel 1. Let's read real a few moments now to about the prophets. And then we're going to speak just for a moment. And then go right into the service and call a great group of people here tonight. I believe God's going to do the exceedingly abundantly above all that we could believe. Thank you. believe that? All right. Now, before we open his book, let's bow our heads and talk to him in just a moment. Heavenly Father, we thank thee tonight for the promise of the Holy Spirit. I pray that you'll bless this little group. These next few moments of speaking, may the Holy Spirit... We're not able to open this word, Lord. John saw it over there, one sitting on the throne, and he had the book, and there was no one that was able or worthy to open the book or to loose the seals thereof. No man in heaven, no man on earth, or no one beneath the earth. Oh, he wept much. And then he heard a lamb bleeding, and he looked, and it was a lamb as though it had been slain from the foundation of the world. And he was worthy, and he went and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat up on the throne, and loosed the seal thereof, and opened the book. No Lamb of God come tonight, and as I turn back these pages, open the word to us, Lord. Loose every seal, and may the Spirit of God move in this building tonight. Convince sinners of their wrong. Convince those who are without the Holy Spirit that they will receive it. Convince unbelievers that they're in error. And heal the sick, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Joel 1, beginning with the 
fourth verse, I want to read a little scripture. I don't have time for much more. About 15 minutes talk, and then we'll have about 30 minutes of seeing how many we can pray for, and tomorrow night, likewise, the Lord willing. That which the palm worm hath left, the locust has eaten. That which the locust has left, the canker worm has eaten. That which the canker worm has left, the caterpillar has eaten. Awake, ye drunkards, and weep and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because the new wine uh, is cut off from your mouth. For a nation is come up on the land strong and without number, whose teeth is the teeth of a lion, and he has as the cheek teeth of a great lion. And he has laid my vine waste and is breaking my fig tree. He has made it clean bare and has cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. God bless his word. May it do as he said, not return to him void, but accomplish that which is purpose for. During this time of Joel's prophecy here, the church was in a terrible condition, backslid. Just prior the coming of the Lord, uh, the first time, and how that the Spirit come upon this prophet, and he, he foresaw things, and he saw the, the condition of the Jews, and he saw the condition of the church in this day. Now, this prophecy, of course, like all other prophecy, has a compound uh, meaning. A prophecy sometimes has a natural meaning, then it has a spiritual meaning. Now, of course, the natural meaning of that, even Dr. Schofield, and his footnotes, I'm not a Schofieldite, but, but uh, however, in his footnotes there, he gives that it meant when the Syrians come over and invaded, that's true. But it also had a, a meaning of, of the last days towards the Armageddon. The coming up of the last day, the condition of the church spiritually in the last day. And while I was sitting out this afternoon reading, I thought, I had my turn over to Joel, and I thought, the Lord just spoke to me something about Joel there, and that palm worm, canker worm, caterpillar, and locust, and how I just stripped the tree. Now, that tree was represented again in Matthew 24 when Jesus spoke of the tree. The tree is always, the Jewish church has always been the fig tree. We are the, that's the tame tree and the wild tree. And we were the wild tree which was drafted into the tame tree. Jesus spoke up there in Matthew 24 when you see the olive tree or the fig tree, rather, putting forth uh, buds, uh, you know, that springs now. Likewise, see, when you begin to see the Jews returning to Palestine, in other words, no, the time is not even at the door. Here some time ago, I was speaking with an infidel down the street. And he said, Preacher, I can prove to you that the Bible's a lie. I said, You can't. I just don't believe. He said, It contradicts itself. I said, I want you to show it to me. I said, It isn't there. He said, If I'll prove to you that uh, Jesus of Nazareth told something wasn't true, will you believe it? I said, I don't believe you could do it. Anything is proved is proved. But I said, I don't believe you can do it. He said, I'll prove it by his own words. I said, All right. He said, Look here. Jesus of Nazareth, he studied to be a Roman priest and got sour against the thing and went back out into the world and become a perfect infidel. And was standing, I was on one corner preaching, he was up in the little lot there in New Albany, out in the park, with a Bible in there, so that the honorest book was ever written. It ain't even what well, shouldn't be put on in public literature, but out amongst public literature and things. But all it was so deceiving, it was all he called it. And me down in the other corner, uh, preaching the gospel. He come down there with a big shooter back on his mouth, he said, almost spit on my feet said, you mean to tell me that you believe there is a God? I said, yes, sir. And he said, if I prove to you there's no such a thing as God, will you accept it? I said, yes, sir. And I was just a kid then, and I, I didn't know too much about the Scripture, so he, they don't yet tonight, but I know the author of it. That's the main thing. So then he said, uh, well, how many senses is to the human body? And he's a smart man. And I said, well... Uh, you know, and he said, I want you to say. I said, five. He said, name them. I said, see, taste, feel, smell in here. But all right, if he was a human God, now, as they claim he was, he was made manifest here among us, then one of these five human senses ought to declare him. And he said, uh, is that right? Well, a gang of people, the infidel and preacher together, so you know what he calls. Here come everybody running up to see him. And he was standing there with some groceries under his arm, and I just come out of the store and getting some sandwiches. And he said, um, well, um, is that right? I said, well, that sounds reasonable. Why? He said, all right. Did you ever see your God? I said, well, yes, sir. Why not? He said, now let me see. And I said, well, of course, 
You all said, we ain't talking about faith. I want my sense of sight just the same as yours. If you see him, let me see him. I said, well, I saw him by vision. He said, well, let me see the vision. I said, well, you don't all said, not believe now. No, no, he said, cut me off. He said, you never did see him? You never did feel him? I said, well, I felt him. He said, no. Well, if you feel him, let me feel him. He said, my sense of feeling is just as good as yours. It's the same sense. He said, bring him here, let me feel him here, and I'll believe him. He said, you said you felt him? I said, I feel him in my heart. He said, well, let me feel him that way. I said, well, you get down and believe him. He said, no, not your psychology. I want to know truth. And he was on. Oh, I know I wasn't up against no <laughs> little boy. <laughs> and chewed that tobacco, you know, and spit down like that. And I said, well, don't spit on my foot, sir. And so he said, um, oh, she said, you're all tied up here, aren't you? He said, you never did see him, feel him, taste him, smell him, or hear him. And therefore, if none of the five senses won't declare him, then there's no such a thing. And quit your nonsense, Randy, you're deceiving the people. I thought, oh, my. <laughs> he said, now, if he's a human God, said, you believe that he was human? I said, yes, sir. I believe that Jesus Christ was human. And he rose from the dead, and he's among men. And, hey, yes, sir, I believe that. He rose from that body. Yes, sir, that's, that's right. All right, now let me see. Let me see one of the senses declaring. Oh, he had a pretty stiff argument. I thought, oh, Lord, <laughs> I've been preaching about three months, then. and I thought, what am I going to do? I said, Lord, you told me take no thought what I'd say. That you said you'd add it. That, at that time, I thought, Lord, what can I do? In my heart, I was praying. I began to see something, you know, they say, give a cow enough rope, it'll hang itself. So that's about right. So I began to see something moving up, the Holy Spirit moving. I said, <clears throat> that's true. I said, I, I certainly, I, I believe you. Oh, he said, you're beginning to come to yourself, aren't you? I said, maybe I am. I said, I, I tell you, you're really a smart man. <laughs> I said, you got a good mind, buddy. He said, well, my mother never raised no fools. And he spit like that. And I said, um, well, I said, you're really a smart man. you got a good mind. He said, sure, i got a good mind. I get away from all that kind of stuff. I said, just a moment. Did you say you had a mind? He said, well, sure. <laughs> I said, I don't believe it. <laughs> and he said, well, what's the matter with you? You must have lost what you had. And I said, no. I said, if you, is it a human mind? <laughs> he said, uh, why, yes. I said, now, come on. I was gentleman with you. You be gentleman with me. I said, you won't embarrass me. Now, come on. Was it a human mind? He said, why, well, yes. I said, if it's a human mind, one of those human senses then ought to declare it. I said, how many senses are there to the body? He said, well, uh, I said, you name them. How many are there? He said, five. I said, what are they? <laughs> he said, well, we, I said, you say them like I did. <laughs> See, I was holding my point to him. He said, see, taste, feel. I said, did you ever see your mind? Smell your mind? Taste your mind? Feel your mind or hear your mind? No, sir. I said, then you haven't got any mind. That's right. You are just absolutely. He said, he said well, I know I got a mind. I said, I know I got a God, too. That's just exactly. Amen. And I, one of the boys was standing there, had a rose pinned on his lapel, and I pulled the pin out like that. I thought I'd have a little fun out of him, man. I walked over where he was, and I said, Now you see what I mean? And I stuck him on the arm. I, he said, Hey! And I said, Did you feel that? He said, Yeah. And I said, He was going to slap me then. So he said, I said, I didn't feel it. I said, I didn't feel it. He said, Let me stick you. And I said, That's what I thought. <laughs> That's right. You accept the same Christ I, I accept, and now you're feeling the same way I feel him. That's exactly. Let the pen stick the other way. It's possible you can be sitting here, every one of us has got the same senses, and you can have such a headache that you can't hardly sit still. And I wouldn't have no headache. How do I know about your headache? It's something dealing individually with you, and how the Spirit of God can come down into a group of people and can uh, baptize that person in such a way that the power of God carries them to where they don't even know where they're standing. And the next person said, no, I know nothing about it. That's right. Doctor said to me not long ago, said, Billy, don't you think that people, that Pentecostal people, is just excited? I said, no, sir. I don't. He said, well, what makes them that nervous? It's because they scream and holler going. I said, doctor, you mean to tell me that the nerves can be excited without something to excite them? <laughs> something has to excite them. No, sir, what's there? I said, the unseen force of the Holy Ghost moving among us. It excites that born-again spirit. Right. It brings an excitement to that spirit. The power of God foams down through. Faith cometh by hearing the Holy Ghost takes the word, spreads it out over the people to catch it with the power of that regenerated, born-again life. Something's got to cry out. Right. Joel seen the day coming when that would be changed. When it adopts 
God help the day when they have come and do- adopted theology instead of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. God help the day when you when you talk away tithing from the church and, and boil up some old tough rooster and sold it for 50 cents a plate to get money to pay the preacher. It's a shame. You, God help the day that when you've, uh, when you've substituted for the upper room or supper room. God help the day. That's right. What we need a day is a good old-fashioned St. Paul's revival and the Bible Holy Ghost preached back in His power and simplicity. Not long ago, I was thinking I was way up in Canada and I was riding one night. I've been way back about 40, 50 miles, thousand miles from a hard top road last fall. was back there a hunting and I was riding out through the moonlight and I come to where there's a big old burn over and there's a great big bunch of great big tall stately pines. And the moon was shining on it looked like a graveyard, a spooky looking place. And there come a wind coming down. And the wind began to hit him and it'd go moo, just a mournful sound. I stood and looked at it a little bit, and I thought of this scripture right here. Yes, sir. Those trees touching the mind of some of these great big fine side churches standing up here. But just as dead as a doornail. Even the palm worms eat all the bark off of them and everything else. The fiery trials has blazed all the spirit away from it, and there's nothing left but a big statue. Just as dead as can be. And when the rushing mighty wind comes from heaven, the only thing they can do is groan and carry on and say it ain't so. That's right. Or no need that. That's right. They say days of miracles is past. It's just every time God sends a revival and signs and wonders begin to come up and si- fall around the people and things like that, they say, oh, the days of miracles is past. What the palm worm left, the caterpillar eating. What the Methodist left, the Baptist eating. What the Baptist left, the Presbyterian eating. What the Presbyterian left, the Pentecost eating. There's got to priest. God, why you stripped the tree of everything? It's got all the power, all the joy, all the good things that God gives to his church on the day of Pentecost. They tore it out. Nothing left but a big church name. Ha! Hallelujah! Brother, let me tell you what this world needs tonight is a growth. The church. Now the old dead tree stand there. Oh, sure, we got a name. Sure, it just wants the tree, but what about now? That's the Pentecostal church, too. That the hardest kick I ever got about divine healing was from Assemblies of God, man. That's exactly right. He told me that he, uh, we had an army down at Hot Springs, Arkansas, and we couldn't have enough seats. We had several thousand people. He had a great big lot of seats. He said, and anybody believed in divine healing couldn't even sit on his seat. <laughs> oh, my. What a shame. What's the matter? What's the same thing you've took to out of the dead tree? What the palm worm left, the caterpillar eating? The Baptist took the shop away from the Methodist and won't eat this and won't eat that till they stripped the church down till they got them sitting just as dead as a doornail. Right? No spirit, no shop, no joy, no peace, no healing, no nothing. Half, oh my! What the Methodist left the Baptist eating, what the Baptist left the caterpillar eating there. Some other church and this and eat this and this, took that away and this, took that away. You haven't got nothing but just a church creed. Hey! You know that's the truth. That's the truth. What one left the other eating to you ain't got nothing but a big dead tree. And every time God sends a big rush of glory down, you just sit there and moan and say, I don't believe it. It's psychology. It's this and that. It's this and that. Can't even move. Dead from the roots up twice. Dead pups up on the roots. It's a sad looking day. But Joel looked at that and saw it. He said, but God said, I will restore, saith the Lord. Hallelujah. If that wasn't in there, I wouldn't know how to preach it. But I will restore, saith the Lord. I have looked that night there when that wind was blowing through, how stiff and starchy and dead it was, sitting there moaning and groaning when it didn't have no life to bend with it, no bark on it to make it flexible. It just there moaning and groaning on account of the wind. <laughs> my, my, Dr. So and so, Dr. So and so. Oh, my. <laughs> but I have to notice. Down underneath there were some undergrowth coming up. Some little bushes about like that. They had life in them. When that wind began to hit them, they were just twisting and ringing and shouting and having a glorious time. Let me tell you, brother, God's going to raise up a generation of people out of all this dead stuff that's going to restore us half the Lord. God's going to raise the people who believe in signs and wonders. He's going to raise the people who's got joy unspeakable and total glory. And when the rushing mighty wind comes, it gives right into it and frolics and dances and glorifies God. Hallelujah. Green leaves are clapping their hands and having a wonderful time. And a 
Well, what a frolic that little undergrowth is having. But that big old tree started just moaning and groaning. <laughs> same wind, look! The same wind was making one moan and groan was giving the other a big time. And I had the paper, what's this a doing? And every time that little tree would twist, what would it do? It would pull the roots, loosen up the ground. <laughs> That's right, so it could grow deeper and get a better hold. <laughs> Hallelujah! And every time God sends his blessings up on a born again man or woman, it only loosens up the roots to grow deeper, higher, better, freer, boy, by God. But I will restore, saith the Lord. Where that one was burnt down, the other's going to grow up as sure as the world. Amen! There was a needy time, it's right now. Man and women are waiting, going away, all over yonder somewhere. That's the reason I'm trying to get into Africa. They take a man and teach him the language of the native. They teach him about ten years in college, and it takes him ten years over here. When he comes out, if he goes to the farm, he's got to have a cane to walk on his soul. Brother, the only thing you need is a baptism of the Holy Ghost and an honest heart. <laughs> Amen. You know that's the truth. Wait for nothing. God calls you to get going. <laughs> Right on the street, tell somebody we need another Stephen's day. When God sent Stephen's down there, where they tried to kill him and everything else, he's like a house on fire on a windy day. Turn it out if you can. The more you stand, the worse it'll get. Hallelujah. The truth. Oh, I know you think I'm crazy. Go ahead. That's all right. I'm happy this way. Let me tell you, brother. Yes, indeed. If there's a time that we need to ever get to going, is today. I think about back there in the time when Moses back there talking of him the other night. When God said, uh, you say, well, wait till I can get ready. When God called Moses, he didn't have nothing in his hand but a stick. God said, what is that in your hand? He said, a stick? Not very much. But said, take that. How am I going down to whoop that army? Well, what you got in your hand? A stick? Take that and go down. Whatever is near you, pick it up and go on. And away went Moses down there, one man invasion to take over Egypt with a stick in his hand. God told him to take what he had. I see not long ago I was having a, a meeting in a football stadium. And as I went in, I read a little sign. It always struck me. It said up there, it's not the size of the dog in the fight, but it's the size of the fight in the dog. <laughs> That's true. Amen. It's what you got in you, what your makeup is. Yes, sir, brother. I admire a little air day. He was not very high, but he's all dog. <laughs> I like that. I like a man when he's born again, no matter how little high and educated what he is. He's all man. He's all God. Amen. That's what I like of people. No matter how little you are, how you call holy you're over a half cast, whatever it is, stand. Yeah. Hallelujah. I can see the time back there. When old Samson was out there, he had a blessing of God upon him, and a bunch of Philistines got up on him. A thousand of them began to run up on him. He didn't have nothing. Now all these Philistines stand up. What if he said, now, wait till I get out and learn how to spar. Wait till I learn how to do this. Wait till I get, uh, learn some fencing, know how to do them and so forth. Maybe I can get me a sword and come back, practice a little while, maybe I can whoop some of these Philistines. <laughs> Not that. The only thing laying close to him was the a, a jawbone of a mule. And he picked that up in the Spirit of God, come on him, and he killed a whole group of Philistines. What we need today is get out and do something. There's an emergency on. We ain't got time to hang around and press around for things. Let's get going. I think old Shamgard. During the time of the judges over there in Israel, while he was over there, every man done right in his own sight. The Philistines would come up and take all they had and go back with it. Israel would raise their crops, put it in the barn. Philistines would walk right up. That's just like the devil. Rob you of everything. Some of you pastors, get your little church built up just about where you think it's right. And some old devil will come in there and say, Why, well, there's no such a thing as that old Holy Ghost religion. I don't even believe in no such a thing. Brother, what I need to tell you, if you don't believe and get angry, then let your righteous indignation rise up. <laughs> That's right. Called black, black, and white, white. That's true. I see old Shamgar standing out there. He put in his all these. He's uh, not very much short about him in the Bible. The rock was roast enough. He's standing out there. He had his barns all fixed up and everything was just going fine. And he's standing there looking. Thought, well, now maybe every year them Philistines has come. Maybe they won't come this year. And I see my family's all starving and they look so poor and thin. But now, and while he's standing there, he heard a noise. He raised up the window and looked coming down the road. Here comes 600 armed Philistines. There goes his crop. Spear and armor. The big old heavy feet there with the armor on. Trump, trump, trump. Trained man, warriors from birth. Spears in their hands, swords hanging on their side. Six hundred. 
Come up, Sam Gord. You had a nice crop this year. We're glad you worked for us. Here they come up like that. That's the way the devil does. Take away everything you got if you can. Now see him. Sam Gord looked down and thought, oh, here it goes again. He stood there and he thought, well, look down his poor little old wife. A little sunken face, maybe. These little children, their little sleeves were ragged, their clothes were gone. His poor wife was starving there. What will the winter be this time? There it is. Now, all of, year after year they've come, and here they are coming again. I'm just, we're just about to start right here. Now they'll take what i got now. What will it do? Just what gleanings I get out of the field. He stood there and thought, here. Here they come, closer and closer. Tromp, tromp, tromp. These Philistines. As a while is, you don't believe in getting angry, then let the righteous indignation rise. He began to feel it coming up on him. He said, here, I'm a Jew. I'm circumcised. I've got a right. For this land belongs to us. And I tell you, he was a warrior. He couldn't wait till he learned how to fight. He was a farmer. He was a fighter. But he knew that he had the promise of God was with him. And he was circumcised. And if every man here tonight would realize that the things that you got, divine health, everything else, God gave it to you at Calvary. Amen. Every born again man is circumcised by the Holy Ghost. You have a right for every bit of blessing. Let the devil rob you out of none of it. Shamgar didn't have no sword. He didn't know nothing about it if he had one. He didn't have a shield, but he, if he had a shield, he wouldn't know how to use it. But he reached up and got an ox gold. That's an old stick. has got a brass lump on the end of it. He beat the ox through the crowd with it. And he jumped out of that window out there in the middle of that road against 600 armed Philistines and killed every one of them. Hallelujah. What was it? The Holy Spirit. Come on. Hallelujah. That was a need. There was emergency. Something had to be done. He couldn't wait till he got an education, learn how to fight and be a warrior and train up. He had to take what was in his hand and go do something with it. And brother, what's that close to you tonight? You've at least got the baptism of the Holy Ghost. This whole group here, you raise your hand. What's that the greatest weapon you can put in your hand? With the Word of God behind it. Step back up. Don't let them rob you. What the palm worm let the caterpillar eat, but this tree will grow again. How my, we claim to be Christians. How we claim to be warriors of the faith. I remember one time, oh, I was reading a story where Caesar was going to make a great parade and many was going to follow him. And there he was sitting on his chariots riding down the street. And when they did, he stopped over there and said, I want all of my officers tomorrow to meet me here. And I want uh, the one honorable man to ride by my side in this great parade tomorrow. And all the officers, they trimmed their plumes and they polished their shields and everything. And they fixed their big uh, uh, tags on them and so forth. And they was passing by Caesar, each one with his big fine plume, walking straight and sturdy, passing by. Caesar looked at him and sitting there. And after a while, a little bitty old doughboy, there was a little footman, came by. And he's all cut and scratched and scarred and bruised. He passed by and just bowed his head, started running off. He felt so embarrassed, standing before the great emperor. And he started to run away. And directly the emperor said, wait a minute. He said, who are you? He said, come here. He said, yes, my lord. He walked up to him and fell down like that. He raised up. He said, my, you're cut up awful. He said, where'd you get all them scars and things? He said, out on the battlefield fighting for my lord. He said, you climb up here and sit down. You're the one who deserves it. Never about your DDDs. I want to show some marks of the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Where I stood barred. Yes, sir. Take your stand. Yes, sir, show some scars. You ain't had no testimony yet. You haven't done nothing. Get out and do something for God. Do something. Here some time ago, I was reading of Jack Coy, an Indian guy out there in the West. And he was lost one day. And he couldn't find his way in. And uh, he'd been lost. And his horse was about dead. And he was, she, was, she was breathing heavy. All the water was gone. He was in the desert. And he was leading her, staggering. A Christian man, he knew it wouldn't be long until death would finally take him. He was going along. After a while, they hit a buffalo trail where animals had been running. And so he tried to, to get on the horse, and he thought maybe they'd go to water. So he jumped on the horse, and he started going down. The horse couldn't hardly walk, and he couldn't either. So he got down, and after a while, the trail separated. And one went this way, and one went that way. Well, the one went this way just had a few tracks. But the one that went that way was well blazed. And so Jack pulled his horse around to start that way, and the old horse wouldn't go that way. He wanted to go back this way. 
So Jack tried to spur his horse on. She wouldn't go. She kept nickering, trying to go back this way. And he got real angry. And he threw his spurs into her. He cut her till the blood was running out of her. Like that. And she started quivering. She was going to fall. He got off of her. You think, she packed me through this desert. She's been good to me. And how she, now she believes the water's that way. There's not very much of a trail going that way. That's the way it is tonight, friends. There's not very much of a trail leads this way, but it's the way to life. The well, the way he's posted down here is wrong. Anything you want to and go on as long as you put your name on the church book. But being received in the Holy Ghost since you believed is not so very well posted tonight. Listen, I think that Jack reached over, he said, and put the, his head, as Paul said, Beth, I'm sorry that I did that. He said, you have been faithful to carry me this far. And I'm willing to risk my life. I've heard that horses have instinct, that they know where water is. There's animals said, if you carry me this far, I'd have died a long time ago if it hadn't been for you. But I'm going to take your route. I'm about to hold on to you. I'm going to take your route. If we die, we both die together. I think that not comparing my Lord with a, a horse. But he's packed me this far. This good old Holy Ghost religion has brought me safely this far. At the hour of my death, I'll take a hold of Calvary. Hallelujah. Say, you carried me through every six spell and through the blackness and darkness of life and through the bitter parts of hell. I'll trust you in my dying hour. Yes, sir. Not on some theology, but on the Holy Spirit and God's Word. On Christ the solid rock. He hadn't gone with a little piece that way. The horse started trying to trot you support, bleeding on the sides. He had to get the little piece farther down the road until he plunged right into a great big gusher of water there. He said he jumped into the water, him and the horse both, and they drank and he washed her nostrils out and he patted her and they screamed and he thanked God and he raised his hands and cried and shouted and everything like that. Said he's just having a wonderful time. Directly he heard somebody laugh and stand over on the other side with a bunch of drunken prospectors. He come across and he said, who are you? He said, I'm Jack Coy, the Indian Reservation. He said, well, come on over, Jack. He said, we got something to eat. We got some venison here. So he started there and seen they were drinking. So he eat the venison with them. And after a while, they said, all right, Jack. You're... They said, what day is it? They said, we're celebrating the 4th of July. He said, well, this is October. They're all drunk, been out there so long. They didn't. But they found gold. And they were on the road back. And they didn't care. They were just having a big time. And they thought they'd have some fun out of him. So they said, uh, now, one of them staggered up to him, a little old disfigured-looking fellow. He said, all right, Coy. He said, how about having a drink of our good liquor? He said, no, thanks, boys. I don't drink. He said, ah, come on now. You know how drunk he is? He said, yes, you drink. You'll have one drink. He said, no, boys, thank you. He said, I don't drink. He said, now, wait. If our venison's good enough to eat, then our whiskey's good enough to drink. He said, now, you're going to drink. Take a drink. The other guy said, that's right. Tell him about it. We'll back you up. He said, you're going to drink it or you're going to die. So he picked up his 30-30 and threw a shell up. If anybody knows what that means out in the desert, <laughs> when he threw that 30-30 Winchester up, that means something's going to happen. So he pulled up the 30-30 like that. And he said, now, look, Jack. He said, now, if, you, if our venison is good enough for you to eat, then our whiskey is good enough for you to drink with us. If you're so goody-goody and don't want to drink our whiskey, uh, well, then said, you can pay let your bones bleach on this desert. He said, wait just a minute, boys, before you do it. He said, I appreciate your venison. I'll pay you. We don't want you to pay. We want you to have a drink and be sociable. You know how drunks are like that? He said, boy, just a minute. He said, I ain't going to drink. But before you pull that gun up when he was laying it up, he said, I want to ask you something. He said, here, you take this jug, you take this drink, or I'll pull the trigger on this rifle. He said, just a minute before you pull the trigger, let me give you my testimony. He said, I hail from the old bluegrass country, Kentucky. He said, years ago... He said, I stood in the corner one morning of a little old trail bed. My daddy was gone. My mother was laying there and said the morning light was stealing across the little old bare floor. Same kind of place I was raised in myself. No, no boards on the floor, just the dirt. Our, our kitchen table was a stump with legs in it. And so then it stalled off a block of wood and it's sticking up like that. That's what it was, our kitchen table. Some of us eat sitting on the bed. The others eat sitting in an old chair built out of a board off the barn. And then there's, he said, oh, there's a light stole across there. said, God was taking home the sweetest person in the world, my mother. And said, me, a little barefooted boy, running along there not knowing where I'd go. said, I started out the door. And she said, Jack, honey, come here. And said, I run to see what you wanted. said, she put her arms around me. said, her gray hair was streaking down her face. said, Jack. You know, your father died over here in a bar room with his boots on. He was died a drunkard. Jack, mothers are going. 
and said, here's the Bible in here. said, promise me, Jack, that you'll never take a drink. And said, I kissed my dying mother on the brow and said, her arms gripped me and she helped me until the breath left her body. When I had to pull my hands away from her side to walk back and fold them across her breast like this as a dying mother said, and there, I have never drank my first drink from that time to this. Now, if you want to shoot, shoot. And said, about that time, a, a gun fired and a jug bursted in the man's hand and stepped out of the canyon with a little bitty cowboy, tears rolling down his cheeks with two big guns in his hands. said, hold still. Just a minute. said, you won't do any shooting. said, no, sir. He said, I'll shoot, Jack. Hail from the old country over yonder, back down to beautiful bluegrass country. Said my mother was a Christian woman with that old time religion, and said I promised her on her deathbed that I wouldn't drink. But said I'm sorry that I broke that many times. But said the big canyons of heaven heard my gun when it fired a while ago. I'll see the pledge was gone. I'll never drink another drop from this time to that. That reminds me of the old time religion that my mother had. Said I'll never drink it. And there that man together converted that whole bunch of drunks to the Lord Jesus Christ. I breathe tonight what the caterpillar left back out of the palm we're eating. But I breathe that. Same old time Holy Ghost religion lives in the world today and is willing to save anybody from a life of sin. Amen. Let's see. Oh, my. Let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee tonight that the undergrowth is coming up. The fig trees putting forth buds again. Oh, God, send the rain. Farmer and let it rain together that the trees might grow, Lord, coming up in this blistered, sin-cursed, damnable world. May it be done to fulfill what you spoken to the prophet Joel. I believe that you'll do it. God, I pray tonight that you'll bless in a marvelous way this people. May the Word of God sink deep in somebody's heart. Someone who had an old mother or dad who knew you. But today, how sad that mother's religion's life that made fun of. They say it was for old time people. God, it's the same Holy Spirit today. Yeah, they went out and blistered the bark off their churches and trees and took all the life out of it. All the heartfelt religion, all the shouts, all the praises, all the joy. All the healing powers, all that the Bible speaks of, just like a lodge. Go there, return, do the same things as the rest of the world. God, bring the undergrowth quickly, Lord, send the rain. Send convictions to hearts tonight, who's needy here. May they find Christ as their Savior. While we ask it in His name, and while you have your heads bowed, I wonder tonight, sitting here, if you can remember an old mother, dad, years ago that you said, Mother, I'll meet you on the other side. You remember when God taking the baby out of the home, you said, Lord, I'll, I'll serve you, but you failed to do that? Are you here and want to receive Christ as Savior? Most to be remembered in a word of prayer. Would you raise up your hands right quickly? God bless you, mister. God bless you, sir. God bless you. God bless you and you. Somebody to my right would say, Brother Bram, remember me in prayer. I, I need Christ as my Savior. I believe in old-time, heartfelt religion. I believe it the thing. God bless you way back there, sir. I see someone else would say, remember me, Brother Bram, here in the middle aisles. Would you say, remember me? God bless you, sir. God bless you, lady. I see you. Someone else say, remember me, Brother Bram. I need Christ as my personal Savior. Raise up your hand. Say, I want to now accept Christ. I wonder why we have our heads down. We're pressed awful for time. I preached just a little long, but I felt the Holy Spirit would have me do this. Surely you will respect it as the Word of God. I wonder why the sister gives us a card on the piano. If those who want to accept Christ now as personal Savior, not time to come down to the altar, but you would stand up and say, Brother Branham, I now stand as a witness that I forsake sin and accept Christ as my Savior. Pray for me now. Would you just raise up, if you would, just as a sign that you want to accept Him, and then I'll have prayer for you right here, and you stand right where you are and accept Him. Will you do it? Will you stand up and say, I'm standing up now as a sign. Don't let that person sit next to you keep you out of the way. God bless you, lady. God bless you, sir. Just remain standing. Someone else won't 
Ghost, you receive him. Raise up. God bless you, sir. God bless you. Just remain standing. Someone else now. God bless you, sister. Just remain. God bless you back there. I see you. Somebody back in here now say, God bless you, sir. Just remain standing. Someone else say, I want to accept Christ as my personal Savior. God sees you. He sees you right there just the same as he sees you here. God bless you, young lady. I see that's a gallant deed for you to do. God bless you, sister. I see you. Somebody down in, here, down in this way say, I want to stand, Brother Branham, to say, I now want to accept Christ in the old-fashioned way. I want. God bless you, both of you ladies. Just remain standing, if you will. Now, is there anyone else? Just before closing now, we're going to have prayer for these people. Now, way back in the back, I see you with your hand up. I know God sees you too. He knows your heart. Would there be one more who wants to accept Christ? I see you, sister, with a little baby in your arm. That's fine. Now, someone else, would you stand up right quick now? Say, I want... God bless you, brother. I see you. God bless you, sister. I see you. That's fine. Just remain standing. God, God bless you, young lady. I see you also. Someone else, just stand up and say, I want to accept Christ right now, Brother Branham. I believe with all my heart that the old-fashioned religion that John Wesley preached, that well, back kind of when Calvin and Knox, just think of it, uh, George Wheatfield, he preached so hard and so loud they could hear him two miles away, preaching the same gospel that you're hearing right now. But what's the matter? The big fine churches don't preach it no more. How many is going to believe out there now with all your heart? All right, now be reverent. This is the hardest thing to do. If you only knew, friends, how that it's swaying from one thing to another. It's like running on one road and taking to another. It's all the Holy Spirit. It's all God. But different ministrations. Now, I'm not a preacher. Not I'm a spare tire. I just kind of, when the preacher ain't there, I'll try to fill his place. But... Uh, I love the Lord, but my divine gift from God is to hear pray for the sick people. That's what he commissioned me to do, pray for the sick. But I'm trying to take the preacher's place and also this also. So swaying from one to another makes it hard. It's two anointings. One anointing is just blessing you. Oh, you feel wonderful. The other is just cutting the life from you. It's taken from you. One's adding to you. The other is taken from you. How many understands that? Raise up your hand and say, I believe I understand it, Brother Branham. Virtue and stuff that goes from you, the strength of your life, pulling out. Visions, what they do. Now, just be as reverent as you can everywhere. And I'm going to do everything I can to pray for every person. I'll try my best to get every person that comes here prayed for before I leave the city. You just stick along and be reverent. If you don't get healed before that time, I'll try my best to get you up here and have prayer with you. Before we, before we leave the city. But try to believe God's Word. Just take His Word at it. Now, if I testify of something, and God don't testify of it, then I've told her something that isn't truth. But if I testify of truth, and God has testifies that that is the truth, then you, don't, you mustn't doubt God. You must believe God. Now, Jesus, is there anybody here for your first time? There's a small group tonight. Well, just look at there for the first time, would you? My, that's where it's bad, you see, what makes it hard when you have to find out the preacher, people hardly know the nature of what to do. Now, that's the reason I keep quoting this. See, friends, the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord, when it was upon His Son, Jesus Christ, Jesus did not claim to be a divine healer. He claimed to be just what He was, the Son of God. But he said, I can do nothing except my Father shows me first. Is that Scripture? St. John 5, when he passed by all them cripples and blind and halt and lame and crippled up people, he didn't heal any of them. Went over and healed a man, maybe he had prostate trouble or something. How's the nerves getting along, brother? Better? <laughs> well, I hope this is the time you receive your healing. All right. You come from Virginia, don't you? Somewhere up in there. Yes. All right. That's West Virginia. All right, sir. All right. Now, just have faith. He's here, <laughs> the angel of the Lord. And now he said, when they questioned him, when well, he went by all those people and healed this one man that had diabetes or something, they, they tried to wonder what was the matter. So they questioned this Jesus, and he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing in himself but what he sees the Father doing. Whatsoever the Father doeth, he showeth the Son... 
and the Son doeth what the Father worketh, and I worketh hitherto. Is that right? Then he did not do one thing except God told him to do it and showed him how to do it. His words are truth. Do you believe that's inspired? Sure it is. St. John 5th chapter. Some of them try to cut Mark 16 out, but what about St. John 5 then? <laughs> All right. I have faith. Believe. Now he said, the things that I do shall you also. Is that right? Now he, he knew the thoughts of the people's heart. When he's standing in crowds, he talked to the people. When he's talked talk, talk to a woman one time at the well, he said, come here, bring me a drink of water. She says, it's not customary for Jews to ask Samaritans such because we have no dealing. He said, but if you know who you were talking to, you'd ask me for a drink and I'd bring you a drink. She don't come here to draw. Why, she said, uh, well's deep. And they went on with a long conversation. After a while, when he found out what was her trouble, he went right straight and told her, said, go get your husband. Is that right? Well, then, if he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, here, the Spirit, if you judge me right, I'll, I'll be either a Spirit of God or a Spirit of the devil. You can't be two at the same time. There's no black, white birds, drunk, sober man, sinner saints. You're either, right, you're either a Christian or you're not a Christian. It's either the Spirit of Christ or not the Spirit of Christ. Bitter and sweet water don't come in the same fountains. By your fruits, you still know them. I've lived in Indiana for nearly 40 years. I'm on my third journey around the world. The scientific world and all has tested it, and we got, I guess they had the picture sure tonight. Did you all get what gets the one? The angel of the Lord. The brethren have it here. Now, that's not just some picture, some photograph. That's in Washington, D.C., the only, only supernatural being in all the world's history that was ever photographed. That's what scientists say. George J. Lacey, on your paper, you'll see it there. You have a photostatic copy of his signature on it. Now, here stands a woman a stranger to me. I do not know her, never seen her in my life. God knows her. I don't. If there's anything wrong with the woman, God knows it. But I do not know it. Are we strangers, lady? We are strangers. Now, if Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and forever, I'm talking to the newcomers now. The old ones understand it. Then if he is the same, he said, A little while and the world seeth me no more, yet you'll see me, for I'll be with you even in you to the end of the world. Is that right? Then if he's the same, he'll do the same thing here tonight that he would do if he was here in flesh. Is that right? Now as far as saving you, he couldn't do it if he's standing here tonight. He's already done it. As far as healing you, if he was standing here tonight, he couldn't do it. He's already did it. He's already done everything that can be done. The only thing he can do is come and represent himself in a way of preaching or some kind of a divine gift to point you to that. But now if this woman's a stranger to me and I to her, and if Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and forever, God could reveal to me, just like he did the woman at the well, where that woman's trouble's at. Is that true? Or he like he told Philip when Philip come to him, he said, here comes an Israelite. Who knows no guile? He said, when did you know me? He said, when, I mean, Nathaniel said, before Philip called you, when you were under the tree, I saw you. Is that right? Now, may the Lord Jesus bless. I know these clothes. But I want you to believe now with all your heart and kind of get settled down and begin to look this way. Have faith. And you out there without prayer cards or anything, you sick people, it's not up here. You just believe with all your heart. And now, look. If I've told you the truth that Jesus healed you 1,900 years ago, every one of you that's got faith enough to believe it, your healing is complete in Christ. Then if that's the truth, God will speak to you here and say it's the truth. That's fair, isn't it? Now, I want to talk to you just a moment, lady. You're the, being the first patient. Now, I just want to talk to you a few moments just... Merely to get the Spirit of the Lord beginning to move, you see. So I have to have something to lead me, you see. And if he don't come, well, then I'm perfectly helpless. But you've been suffering quite a bit. And the suffering comes from the female organs. It's cancer. Is that right? You believe he'll heal you? 
come here just a minute. Now, Father, in the name of thy Son, Jesus, I ask for this woman's life. Knowing that this enemy has caught her, I ask you to move him away from her as your humble servant. I pray that you will grant it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. God bless you, sister. Don't doubt. Go believe him. Have faith now. Everybody believe with all your heart. Reverend, all right, lady. Are we strangers? We don't know each other. You just picked up a card a few minutes ago out there, and they called your number, and you come up on the platform. That's as far as life as we've seen each other or know. Is that true? Then only God knows your heart. I do not. But you you're know that something is near. You know that the Spirit of the Lord... You have a strange thing. You're, you're, you're wanting children. Isn't that right? <laughs> Well, Simeon said in the temple of old, or Eli, rather, said, The Lord bless Hagar, and she brought forth the baby. You've been sterile. Come close just a moment. <laughs> Heavenly Father, in the day that's so evil now, and here's a woman mourning a little one, God bless her, as you have the many hundreds across the country, and make her well of this, and may she embrace this loved one that she wishes in Jesus Christ's name, amen. God bless you, sister. Go receive it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, one day, not long ago, a little lady come to my house. She may be here tonight, for all I know. She has been wanting a little baby for years. I had prayer for her, and the lady has a lovely little boy baby. How many knows Richard T. Richard Reed of Jonesboro, Arkansas? Well, the blessed old Bible, our tabernacle. He's a pastor there. His wife, many years ago, been barren for years. And one morning I walked out of the room. She was taking shots from the doctor and everything, which almost caused her to lose her mind. And it didn't do any good. One morning I walked out of the room. I said, Sister Reed, I see you hold a little boy baby in your arms. You shall have it. God has rewarded you. And she was playing an old favorite song of mine. It's not a Christian song. It's Home on the Range. I think it sounds so peaceful. And I said, God is going to bring peace to your family, and he's going to bring the little boy baby. And five years from that year, she embraced the little boy baby, and I was holding him two or three weeks ago in my hands, trotting him up and down the aisles of the place right where it was said. The Lord God granted. That's one of hundreds. You might wonder just why just saying one thing to the people and let it pass on by. It's because of more you talk to people, more you know about people as the visions keep breaking. But I want to try to get to as many as I can. You stand and talk to someone, just keeps on moving, keeps on going, keeps on moving, talking. Now, lady, you, do you believe the things that you see? You believe it to be the truth? You do. Well, perhaps I'll just talk to you a little bit. Are we strangers? We are strangers. Yes, ma'am. I don't believe I ever seen you in my life. Then, if I am a stranger and you are a stranger, neither one of us met each other in life before, and this is our first meeting place, just raise up your hand so the people know it. That's true. i never seen the lady in all my life, know not, nothing at all about her. God does. Now, if he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, if I should talk to this woman and it would be his divine will, he could reveal to me, but it's his will. I can't make it. He could even speak that woman what's wrong with her or something about her life or what she has done or what's hindering her or, or if she's something else, God would tell her about it. You know how that is. If it's sin in the camp, it'll sure be called out. That's right. It won't pass. Unconfessed sin. If you'll watch it, it always catches that unconfessed sin. How many knows that's true watching it in the audience chair every night? See, it certainly is. It catches unconfessed sin. And I want to talk to the woman. I want you all to be reverent. Now, sister, uh, if our Lord Jesus, I know he loves you because he died for you. 
And, and if I be his servant, then, and you is, be his servant, then there'd be something about you. If there is sickness, then there's something here. And both of us human beings, it's trying to get your faith to look to something. That's what I'm talking about. And every word that I'm saying, uh, God has given me utterance or I wouldn't even be standing here. I'd be dead. Is that right? And standing here at this Bible, on the sacred desk, the pulpit, the closest place to heaven on the earth, certainly. You, um, you've come from a distance here. Is that right? You come on a bus, didn't you? I've seen you getting on a bus and getting off of a bus. Uh, just a moment, it left me. Just, oh, yes, that's right. And you have um, something that's uh, in the it's in the liver, isn't that right? That's right. Cancers in the liver. Is that the truth? That's the truth. Now, if that's the truth, let the people know. Now you hear that was talking. That wasn't me. That that was my voice. But I, I could hear myself. Now, let's talk just a little longer, see if it's... Do you, um, do you believe me to be his prophet? Yes, sir. You do that. I believe you do, too. With all your heart, God bless you. You have other sorrows in your heart, too. You're concerned about someone. Is that right? It's a boy. Isn't that right? And that boy is... Had an operation some time ago. Yes, it was on the spine. Yes. And it paralyzed him. Yes, and the only thing he can lift is his left hand. Yes, and two fingers on that left hand. I see him moving the fingers. Yes, is that right? Yes, Isn't he a great lover of sports such as yes. fishing and hunting and th like that? Isn't that true? Yes. God bless you. Come here. Our Heavenly Father. Be merciful to this poor woman standing hopeless, helpless, without you. God grant the blessings that she desires. Thou knowest all about her. I can't remember at this time, but thou knowest all things. And I pray that you will bless her and give her the desire of her heart, making her well. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Sister, with your faith. Yes, I, there's something about you just keeps moving on. I see you're fading away from front of me again. Mm -hmm. You're going to get well. Thank so you. God bless you. Thank you're God. going to get well. God bless you. God bless you. <laughs> Wonderful faith. I wish everybody here had faith like that. Uh, lady, just a moment. Didn't you cross a river to get here? You come from Kentucky, didn't you? Is that right? I thought I'd seen that bus cross the river when I looked around that time. God bless you. <laughs> but I want to ask you something else. Is that boy with you? He isn't with you. But he was with you. Is that right? I've seen him with you, too. God bless you. Now go on on your road rejoicing. Oh, if you could have faith like that, anything could happen. Believe God. Sir, you've been watching me all along, each night and everything. I know what's your trouble. But you're sitting there a while ago. You was praying. You was praying that God would do something for you or speak to you tonight. Is that the truth? I wasn't reading your mind, but I, I know what he was saying. And I know where your trouble is, and I believe if you're willing to take my word as God's prophet and accept what I tell you is the truth, God will heal you. You believe you can do that? You have a heart trouble, don't you, sir? Is that right? Now stand up and say, Lord Jesus, I accept you as my healer. God bless you, brother. Now go home and get well. God bless you. All right. I believe I know you, lady. Aren't you the lady from Chicago or something about a, about a cancer case one time? Heal of cancer. Ma'am, heal of cancer. You're the lady that was outside of that a place that morning where I come out of that friend of yours that was healed with something out there, that great 
meeting going on in Fort Wayne. I thought I remembered your face. Oh, yes, I got you now. Excuse me, you are Miss, um, your, uh, your husband, I met you in Florida one time, and your husband has a spaghetti company or something, is that right? That's right. All right, see, you understand what's going on now then, if you've been to meetings before. It's something. I know you're my friend, but I want to know it's not your own conditions. It's for a loved one, your daughter, with heart trouble. Isn't that true? It seems like I've seen two children up here there. Is that right? Two grandchildren. Two grandchildren. And one of them's fixing to have an operation. Nose or something wrong in the nose condition. Is that right? Yeah. And the other's got a kidney trouble. Is that right? And you want to ask blessings for them. Let's turn our faces to God right now. Lord Jesus, we pray that you will help these people that she's standing here, this little mother tonight, who's been along and seen your great mighty hands move. Now, I lay my hands upon her in representative way of the hands of our Lord and ask that all her requests will be granted tonight and she'll be given the desire of her heart in these matters. In Jesus Christ's name, I ask it. Amen. God bless you, sister. Go and let me hear. Those children was across the waters, wasn't it? South America. All right. Believe us thou this? Then have faith in God. Feel different now, don't you, brother? I thought if you just a little push to make you receive it, you see. Last night you tried awfully hard. You're sitting somewhere in the building. I watched you last night. I know another person here is very, very sick and been trying the last couple of nights. I believe they're going to get healed directly. I've watched him go to him twice already tonight. Come, lady. Have faith now, everyone in God. Believe Him with all your heart. God shall bring it to pass. How do you do, sister? Do you believe all these things? You believe the preaching of the Word is truth? You do. And you believe that faith cometh by hearing, hearing of the Word. And you believe that what we ask God, we receive because we believe we get what we ask for. And will you believe with me? And for your faith, to, you believe that God could tell me what's wrong with you? He could. He could. You believe he will? I believe he will. You got a, a little scare because that you had a cancer. That's right. And the cancer was in the head or in the ear, I'd say, in the ear. Yes, sir. And, I have my ear too. And you're afraid that the cancer is coming to the ear. Is that right? And that's in the right ear. That's where I see where they was examined, look into that ear. Is that true? That's true. All right, come here just a moment. Lord Jesus, I bless this poor old mother. No doubt at all, Lord, but this poor little old feeble hand that I've got here now has washed the many days washing, brushed back the tears from the crying baby's eyes as she rocked it. Been a mother, but oh, God... It takes someone now, a nail-scarred hand, to brush back the fears and tears here. Grant it, Lord. May she go home and all fears leave, and may she get well. Live many more happy days. I bless her for this purpose. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. God bless you, sister. Go now, being happy, rejoicing. And Thank God, you, Jesus. That's the way to do it. All right. Poor little old mother. Now... If you can believe, all things are possible. Now, sir, are you and I strangers? We are strangers. Now, I don't know nothing about you. No more than you're just standing right here before me. Then I'm telling you that Jesus died for you 1,900 years ago to save from sin, to heal from sickness. Do you believe that's the truth? Well, if I'm telling the truth, God will vindicate the truth. And I say that his attitude today towards the sick is just like it was when he walked on the Sea of Galilee. He could not heal. He could only do as the Father said.
Is that right? But if God will reveal to me your trouble, would it help your faith to believe? Well, you're a nervous type of person. It has a, a cause of a kidney condition of getting up at night. But another thing, one of the main things wrong with you, oh yes, you're an arthritis case. I see you trying to get out of bed. You're stiffened up. Is that right? Yes. With arthritis. You believe God will take it away from you now? Almighty God, may this devil be rebuked in Jesus Christ's name and may he go out of the man and may he go now and be made well in Jesus' name. Amen. Raise up your hands and praise him now. Say thank, thank you, Lord. Jesus, I walk off the platform just rejoicing. Now, the man had arthritis bad. I could see him in the vision where he could hardly walk. Anybody know him? Let's see if they know that's the truth. Raise up your hands. That's right. The people are out there. The man's healed. Let's say thanks be to God. God can do all things for us. All right. You believe, young man? If God would reveal what was wrong, would you believe it? Do you want to get over cancer? Would you like to get over your, your cancerous condition? You would? Would you accept Jesus as your healer? Lord God, bless the man and may that demon of cancer leave him right now. In Jesus Christ's name, may he go. God bless you. Now go rejoicing, brother. Being happy, God will grant it. All right. Do you believe, lady? Do you believe the things that you hear is the truth? Now there's something with this lady that somebody's got sitting right out through there somewhere. Uh, the angel of the Lord swept up in there. It's that was they sitting right there with high blood pressure. You're healed, sister. You have diabetes, and you're healed. So you rejoicing is the blood of the God bless you. The Lord be with you, sister. All right, come on. Do you believe with all your heart? Just a moment. Walk around this way just a minute, lady. Just a minute. Now, the Lord Jesus can do the exceedingly, the abundantly. Do you believe that? Above all that we could even do or think. You believe that? Stomach trouble. That's right, isn't it, lady? All right? You had stomach trouble, too. All right, you're both healed. Now you can go on your road rejoicing and being made well. That's the way to believe God. Have faith in God. faith now. Don't doubt. Come, lady. You want to get over heart trouble? Believe that God will make you well? Lord Jesus, bless her poor soul, Lord, and give her great faith, and may this heart trouble leave her in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. God bless you, sister. God bless you. Do you believe, lady? Oh, yes. Now, while the anointing's on, I talked to you uh, somewhere, some other. I've seen you before somewhere. Oh, it was this afternoon I met you on the highway. Is that right? All right. I'm glad you got here. Now you go on your road and rejoice and be happy and believe God with all your heart. You'll get well. Lord Jesus, bless your eyes, praise in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Have faith in God. Just a moment. Believe him with all your heart. I hope you understand that when a, every person in here is a spirit. You understand that. And you're everyone sitting there a solid wall of faith believing. And it's just moving first one place and another, you see. I can't tell this where it goes to me, where the vision starts to break. It materializes before me, and then I have to look and see if I can see the person. And as the vision struck right here just then, I can't tell if 
right in here is where it looked like a man. Yes, but I can't place where the man is. But I believe this fellow sitting here praying, I believe it's some of his relation that's got a, a back trouble, something wrong in the back, and a stomach trouble. A brother, I believe. Is that right, sir? Right there. I've seen a man, can't, it sits right along there somewhere. Got a stomach trouble and a back trouble. It's a man, he's kind of a, a young-like fellow. I've seen another standing by him, looked a whole lot like him, but he, he vanished away. He's standing right there, right over top of that fence. That's so much pulling and carrying, I can't, I can't locate the person, just keep a praying. Maybe I can find it. It's right in there somewhere. I've seen the man standing like this, and it went out up from me. I've looked all through here, and I can't see nobody. It looks like him. I've seen a man praying there, and I thought maybe it was for some of his people. All right, be reverent. Have faith in God. All right, bring the lady. You want to get over that sign that's sitting right back there? If you do standing out there on the end of the road, just believe and have faith in God. God will grant it to you. All right. How do you do, lady? I want to talk to you a minute. Single your life out. See, when you so much from that side, it's hard to get it sometimes. You, um, you've had some trouble, haven't you? And you, you've had an operation, haven't you? That's right. It's left you with kind of weak spells. You're having a weakness. Isn't that true? Is that right? It was a cancer operation. That's true, isn't it? And aren't you concerned about a loved one? It's a husband, isn't it? That's right. He has some kind of a rectal trouble, hemorrhoids, cancer, isn't that true? Well, go home. God bless you. I believe you're both going to get well. Lord, I pray that you'll bless her and may she and her husband live long, happy lives together. Grant it, Lord, in Jesus Christ's name, I ask it. Amen. God bless you, lady. Go rejoicing. Do you believe God? Have faith in him now. If you believe with all your heart, God will bring it to pass. Do you believe it? All right. A lady has sinus trouble sitting right there, and there's something wrong in her breast, a hurting in her breast. But if you believe, you can get well. Do you believe that? God bless you. And you can rise up and accept your healing. <clears throat> you also have sinus sitting right behind her there also. The man, is that right? Isn't that the truth? The lady sitting right next to you there also is sick. She's had some surgery of some kind. I see a hospital bed. They're working on her legs. It, no, it's a varicose veins. Was that right? And now you're taking some kind of needle treatments for it. Isn't that true? Stand up. Jesus Christ makes you well. Amen. The rest of you want to believe at this time? You want to you believe now? Jesus Christ is the ensign. All right. Now, there, just a moment. Lay your hands over one another. Now, do this as I ask you, will you? Do you believe that God has told the truth here? Do you believe with all your heart? Say amen. amen. Now, if you do believe these words as his prophet, I say it, that Jesus Christ has healed every one of you through the building. You're every one healed was 1,900 years ago. Can you accept it? If you can, just stand up to your feet and say, thank you, dear God. Father, I pray that you'll heal everyone in evil spirits and move and heal this. Everyone in this handkerchief box in Jesus' name. All right, brother. Thank you.